Good evening and welcome to this Vermont PBS evening conversation with Dr. Francois Clemens. I'm your host for this evening, Jane Lindholm. And I think, I think the first time I met Francois Clemens was probably at a Middlebury College basketball game after he had sung the national anthem when he and my father greeted one another. But I actually can't remember. It seems strange to not remember a first meeting with someone as charismatic as Francois. But that's part of his wonder. Once he's in your life, it feels like he's just always been there. Like he can even take up a presence in your past, a past he wasn't a part of. Maybe he was around for my whole childhood in Middlebury. He wasn't. But then again, he kind of was around for my whole childhood and maybe the childhood of those of you watching this evening, or maybe he was a presence in the lives of your children. Because the characters that appeared in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, the neighbors, were almost like our own neighbors, our own family. We knew them and we felt they knew us. That feeling of intimacy through a camera lens was something that Fred Rogers excelled at. And as you'll discover this evening, it's equally something Francois Clemens excels at. He made history as Officer Clemens on the award-winning PBS television series, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, as the first African-American actor to have a recurring role in a children's television program. He's a Grammy award-winning opera singer, founder of the Harlem Spiritual Ensemble, emeritus artist in residence at Middlebury College. He's an actor, arranger, director, activist, mentor, spiritual parent. And with the publication of Officer Clemens, a memoir, he now adds author to the list. I'm so pleased to get a chance to talk with him this evening. Francois Clemens, welcome and thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much, Jane. It's wonderful to see you and have a chance to chat with you. This is a very exciting time for me. Well, it's an exciting time for me and for those of us gathered tonight to listen to you talk, to hear a little bit more about your life, including your time on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And those of you watching tonight, I want to know, I want to let you know that you can participate. We would love to know what questions you have for Francois Clemens. So you can actually put your questions right into the chat function. I believe it should be on the right hand side of your screen. And let us know your first name and what town or city you're in and what your question or comment for Francois is. And by the way, while you're there, you can find a link in the chat box to purchase an autographed copy of the new paperback version of Officer Clemens. Is that what you're holding right now, Francois? Yes, that's one of the reasons <laughs> I'm so excited because it's coming out literally today is the first day of publication. I was equally as excited last year when the hardback was published on the same date. And now I thought because of the pandemic, ah, yes. <laughs> But, you know, I thought with the pandemic and all the, the problems we have with health and that the book would not do well, but it's like a lot of people stayed home and read so, uh -huh. uh, a lot. I mean, everywhere I did so many Zoom sessions where we talked about uh, my early life uh, in the South and then my fa mother and father separating and my winding up in Ohio and uh, things that I thought were characteristic of the South, I found just as much in the Midwest and what we call the North. And then, as you said earlier, I went to a way to college, wound up in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and met Fred Rogers. And for many people, they would say, the rest is history. But there was a lot of other things that happened in my life that I felt were important for me to mention and talk about, which is why I wrote this book. Well, I loved reading the book, and I just want to, to pull out one passage as we get started here. At the beginning of the book, you write a letter to Fred Rogers, and you talk a little bit about why you want to write this book and what he means to you. And you say, as you're going through thinking about, you know, should you write a book about this and why and what would make your book different? And I'm going to quote you here. You said, uh, one thing that all of the previous biographies and writing about Fred Rogers lacked was that none of them were written by a Black, gay, ordained person of the theater who had worked intimately with you for over 30 years yeah I guess I guess none of the other people could claim that <laughs> well that made me kind of singular uh -huh. and, uh, because of some of the uh, racial things that are going on in our country now I feel that it's important that we include the contributions that Fred did make and they were more than casual contributions and so I grew and understood uh, some of the problems that black people have been having in this country. And Fred was someone that I could bounce this off, the, the frustration, the sometimes anger, 
And sometimes it tremendous hurt. I could discuss those things with him. And we can talk about this a little bit later, but I went on three national tours for Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, singing as Officer Clemens, I dressed up, and I went to Memphis and Nash Nashville, uh, uh, Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Montgomery, uh, Atlanta, you name them. And I went to black communities and daycare centers and what have you. <clears throat> and I sang some of Fred's songs, but I also sang American Negro spirituals, which are very close to me. And I talked to the children. Uh, a lot of the audiences were simply daycare to either the children or their parents or their teachers or other people who assisted. And we discussed the history uh, here in America that is not generally talked and taught in the school system. I had no idea of my black history when I graduated from, uh, from high school and from Oberlin and then went on to Carnegie Mellon. And one of the things that I kept saying, Fred, well, when did that happen? When did this happen? Why isn't this in the history books? Why isn't that there? And so I began a course of self-education, which he was very much a part of. And so the touring around America was, uh, you know, bringing me up to date on places like Tuskegee and the significance of Tuskegee Airmen and the Tuskegee Institute, which became Tuskegee University, the, the, uh, uh, the um, traditional black colleges. I had no idea uh, about Fisk and Tuskegee and, uh, and uh, Tougaloo and, you know, Jackson State, that these were historically black colleges that had a significant role in the educating of black people in this country. And in fact, when you went on tour with Fred Rogers and other neighbors from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, part of what you were trying to do was to bring the program to black neighborhoods in America, because you, you say it was true that Mr. Rogers' neighborhood was seen as and often felt like and was a show for suburban white children. And that wasn't necessarily what Fred Rogers had intended, but that's, that was the feeling of the show and you wanted to help change that and to make sure that young black children were as equally a part of the neighborhood as suburban white children. You're absolutely right. And when I explained this to Fred, he totally understood. And he said, what, what should we do about it? He came to me in that instance and it was my suggestion to come up with this tour. But there were many things where we shared our un racial understanding as American citizens that were different. Fred was a blue blood, as I say. He was born on the right side of the track. His family had money. He, went to, he was well educated. He had a history among his family. I'm on the other side of, the, of the, the tracks and we were poor. My parents never went to high school. Uh, they could, my father couldn't write his name. They could barely read and write. And the list like that went on. And nevertheless, we found a meeting as someone else has be said better than I have. We met in the middle. And in that middle was a lot of common ground. And I, he gave me so much uh, of, him, of his person. He took time. He was a great listener. Everyone who knows anything about the program knows that because of his innate um, introverted nature, he was inclined to listen. Well, you are looking at the last grand extrovert. There is nothing introverted about me. And I, I know people don't quite understand what I tell them. He never stopped listening and I never shut up. <laughs> I never did. Why did I? Why should I? Uh, they didn't quite understand what an incredibly close bond we had, which included me talking and him listening. But it was you because of his personality. Well, and you say in the book, it, it didn't occur to you until many, many years in friendship <laughs> and working relationship that he was mentoring you, that he was a mentor. You you worked yes. with him for so many years without realizing that. Before we go too deeply into your time on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, let's back up and talk about what makes you so special in telling this book and, and that, that difference that you have from others and your upbringing. I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about what you remember from your early childhood and your family's homestead and the importance really of the elders in your family. Well, I was raised primarily by women. My great grandmother, Laura May, my grandmother, Minnie Green, my mother, her sisters and my cousins, my Aunt Emma, my Aunt Hattie, my Aunt uh, um, Bess, my Aunt Cora, 
there were the, you know, it seemed like they were everywhere, these women. And they were the ones who nurtured me, who I, they sang to me when I was little, along with my great grandfather, but primarily the women. And I was a house boy. I wanted to be in the house with my mother, with my great grandmother and my grandmother. I was not a guy who wanted to go out and have all kinds of adventures. And I look back on that life, the early times in, uh, in Alabama. I was born in Birmingham and we lived in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa. And that I was gay. I, I had this thing, something inside of me that was reticent and I held on to it because I also heard as I grew up five, six, seven, I heard stories about the F word, gay people, men who liked men and those kinds of things. So I began to hold a very important part of myself to myself, very, very private. And in spite of the fact that Fred Rogers said, you can't come out, when I talked to him about being gay, he said, because the sponsors of our television program would not tolerate an openly gay person as one of the characters. So uh, I, I did not have that luxury of sharing what I consider the deepest, most sensitive part of myself. I was constantly being told, no, you can't do that. No, you can't share that. No, that's not appropriate. If I talk to a minister, if I talk to a counselor, if I, you know, for years, homosexuality was considered some kind of illness, sickness. And I, it was a long time before I said, Fred, you mean you like me the way I am? That I'm okay? And he said, yes, I love you just the way you are. And he said, you know, you don't ever have to be anybody else, Francois. Uh, that was a, a major change in my life when he said that to me directly. And I knew that he meant it, that he was invested, as you said, in mentoring me and not just paying me as an actor on the program. Hasn't that though then been such a problem for, for queer people for forever? Uh, even when they're accepted within certain circles, they're not accepted within others. And even Fred Rogers who said to you, I like you just the way you are, was also saying, but you can't be who you are publicly. And, and he encouraged you to get married to a woman. And he encouraged you to make sure that that piece, that part of yourself that as you say, is so essential to your being wasn't something you shared publicly. And that, that, that question of how out can you be and who can you be out with is something that queer people still struggle with. But certainly for you, here was your mentor saying, I love you, but don't be out publicly. Jane, it was like a, a, a stab in my heart. I, I, he understood and then he had the power to help me to understand that. At the same time, he was the one who said, close the book. You can't go there. You can't write that. Uh, you can't go to those clubs. You can't have a partner that way openly because people will say terrible things about you. They don't understand. And he really helped me to understand why he was so reticent, why he said you can't do it on the air. It was financial. I mean, you've got Sears, you've got Johnson & Johnson, and you've got other uh, uh, um, pub publishers like uh, uh, what was it, Johnson Johnson for, for children, not Johnson and Johnson, but what is it, Johnson? Uh, anyway, they were the sponsors of the, of the program and they made uh, baby lotion and baby powder and all that, but you could not come out and have, you know, and be gay. They felt they would lose all of their support. And so I, um, I, I got myself together, I uh, made a decision, which was a terrible decision to get married. And it was not fair to my former wife to have someone who I knew that I was gay. And she knew that I was gay. But our understanding of sexuality and that, that kind of thing deep in each one of us, who we are, was unknown, unthought of. Everyone told me, don't do it. Had I been alive now asking advice, I know that people would say to me, oh yeah, take your, <clears throat> take your time. Uh, see, see, you know, tread lightly a little bit, uh, talk to someone if you want to date. I never dated. It's one of the saddest things in my life to think 
when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, I wanted to date the football captain or the baseball player. It was totally impossible. And I repressed, I pressed it down. And it, I had to go see a shrink after I talked with Fred for about four or five years I spent in therapy, understanding who I am, understanding how to express myself, where it was safe, as you said, you couldn't go everywhere. So I had to learn how and what was acceptable because I had cut it off. I had done none of that during those um, earliest years. It's not easy. And that's one of the reasons I wrote this book because I thought I didn't have any role models. Who, who, who could a young black boy in Youngstown, Ohio in 1950 turn to and say, well, how did you do it? How, how did you do it well? Or what is considered doing it well? And those are the kinds of questions that I ask in this book. I want people to read it and young, a person wants a career or if they want, uh, uh, like me, I have a spiritual destiny. I do a lot of research. I did a lot with Fred also exploring what is in the Old Testament, what is in the New Testament. There's a great deal to be sorted out as to what the original fathers consider a sin and what they don't consider a sin today. It's quite a different world to live in. And so I had, I spent a lot of time, in fact, Fred loved to discuss biblical stories of the prodigal son, of the washing of the feet, you know, which we did on the air twice, not once, and other stories of great importance. Uh, Paul on the road of Damascus, when he has the, <clears throat> the spiritual incident that causes him to go blind, and Elias said, Paul, Saul, Saul was his name. Why persecutest thou me? Is how they translated it. And he explains, you know, go to, to Tarsus on the road to Tarsus and you will meet someone there and they will. Do. Anyway, he has a transformation and he comes out of it as a great writer and a great philosopher. But there were things that are implied in his writings that, that make it very, very difficult to live what I would consider a traditional Christian life. So I have left the Christian church. I sing spirituals, which are based on the Old Testament. And I understand what some people need, they're getting, but I wasn't getting what I needed. I found it in the Unitarian Universalist Society, where there's a deep sense of respect for each person's search. And so that is, I feel that's my calling to share that because a lot of uh, people know that I sing American Negro spirituals. And so they ask me, well, well how, do, how do you do that? How do you justify? Well, I think that those who composed, created those songs were very, very sincere. And it's the same thing. You have to enter into that atmosphere in order to be uh, considered legitimate. You're not being superficial. And if I were singing French art song, I'd have the same thing. I'd have to enter into the salon and the lace and the wigs, you know, and the heels that they would wear. There's a whole cultural aspect to what the songs, they don't just stand in a vacuum. So that's how I do it. It's so interesting, too, because you write in the book that you have separated yourself from dogma and from uh, some of the trappings of a formal church. But you've remained close to churches and to congregations your whole life. You grew up in the Baptist church, you sang in others, notably the Episcopal church. And as you just mentioned, you're now very tied in to the Unitarian Universalist church there in Middlebury. And so, you know, is it, is it the singing? Is it that communion with others through song that keeps you tied to, to a church when you say you've sort of broken from that kind uh, of drama? Uh, once I started talking, singing and traveling, uh, there were people who would, are drawn to me. They come and they say, oh, how did you manage? How did you do this, Francois? There's a lot of good in the Christian church, it, but that doesn't mean it's all good. There's a lot of good in every religion. If, you're, uh, if you want to be a Buddhist, Islam, Taoist, uh, 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 um, everything, there's some good. And I try to take the good from all of those different, you know, one of the most remarkably wonderful things I do, I did not do it in the Baptist church is meditate. I meditate every single day. I'm developing my own private 
uh, method of meditation, which includes being quiet, believe it or not. And during that, come and go with me to my father's house, to my father's house, or to my father's house. Won't you come and go with me? Oh, to my father's house, there is peace, peace, sweet peace. Now, that's Buddhist, or is that Christian, or is it Islamic, or what? But it's what connects. And I invite people to come and be a part of it. Francois, I think of interviews with you uh, when I do them with you, not as a linear arc, but almost like a spider web. And we can go in <laughs> multiple different directions. So I'm gonna bring us back to the center for a moment because I, I, I really want you to talk a little bit about uh, your childhood. And I have two questions for you about that. And one is, I wanna hear more about Granddaddy, Granddaddy Saul because when you talk about finding your voice and sometimes losing your voice, yes. it's really tied up in that early relationship with this important male role model in your family, this really wonderful, important person in your life who died when you were just a child, but who taught you some of these songs. He had a singing cane, a magical cane. And yes. that seems to me so crucial to your story because that was the start of your singing journey. Yes, it was. I was very, very, very close to my granddaddy Saul. And uh, he, there was like a Katrina type hurricane that happened in the South at that time. And so we were living on the uh, Sanders plantation. Well, when the storm, the rains kept coming and they were so hard that we, everybody packed what they could and started migrating further away from the, the water. Um, and as life would have it, you know, it, they over the waters overran their borders. So you had crocodiles, you had snakes, you had all manner of animals fleeing the flood. And so were we. It was a caravan of, of disparate, uh, lonely, desperate people who had no idea where they were going to go just away from all that water and flooding. Well, my great grandfather, my grandfather, excuse me, had this cane and we found the cane without him. And that was my first sense of losing something that I loved very much. Uh, he and I, he was my babysitter when we were on the Sanders plantation. And he would almost every single morning, I'd wake up looking for my granddad. I'd look around, I'd find him. And the two of us would eat breakfast or whatever we had to do. And then we would go off and sit by the creek or we'd catch butterflies or if there was a turtle, whatever, uh, um, grasshoppers. And he would say, well, let's go sit down by the river and let's see if the cane will talk to us. And tell, I said, oh, yeah, Danny, I, I love to hear, oh, Lord, trying to live right but the folks down here so hard on me oh, mm -hmm. and he said buttercup you hear that that's the cane singing i said oh it is granddad he said yeah the cane is telling you go on back to africa that's where your people come from boy there's a land where you are were kings and queens. You were not always a slave. Now you listen to what that cane is telling you, boy, because it's telling you your true history. That was my granddaddy talking to me and teaching me to care about myself, to love myself. I had the slightest idea that he was singing until that cane got lost. And when the, uh, I mean, when my granddaddy lost and got lost in the flood and we were, we found the cane and I hugged it to me and my 
Aunt Hera, my Cl Aunt Clara, Hattie, they said, you, you can't have that cane. You are grieving too much for a, a young boy. There was a, a pain inside of me that I still can feel if I allow myself, the loss of my granddaddy. And so I held the cane. When they took the cane away from me, oh, no, don't take that cane away from me. Oh, Lord, oh, oh, hold me. Oh, Africa, I'm coming. I'm going to Africa. I don't have to stay here with y'all. And they said, what are you singing, boy? What are you, where do you, where do you do, where did you hear that from? I said, my granddaddy sang to me and Africa and the cane. And I, they said, that is no place. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You're, you're here in Alabama now. Uh, and, and we're going to make a home here for you. You're not going back to any Africa. But I held on to that. And my aunts and uncles, everybody, they were absolutely flabbergasted that I had those melodies that, uh, and those words inside of me. I didn't always understand what I was singing, but I understood I was expressing pain, deep pain. When you write and talk about your family in the South and your family when you moved to Youngstown, Ohio, mm -hmm. you, you write in their dialect. You use the, the kind of words and language and slang that they used. And I'm curious about your voice now. If, you, if it's different from the way you talked as a child and if you cultivated the voice and accent and the way you speak today, and if you can talk a little bit about how different that might've been from when you were five and 10. Well, you know what it's like if you do a Shakespearean play and you are the characters using the language that Shakespeare used during his time. It is not the English we speak today. So when I am sharing with you my family in the South particularly, and the, I feel that dialect is power. Mm -hmm. When I speak in dialect, I am speaking from a source of deep power. There is a calling that I have that singing these songs and sharing them, I become aware that that is my destiny. And I feel very, very, when I say to you, Charlie, you better come over here. I'm not gonna have all that noise out there. Now I've had enough. That's them. Now I might say it differently, but that thing that comes from within me is how I heard my great grandmother and my grandfather and my aunts and uncles they were all considerably, you know, older than I was. And they, they loved me, but they spoke with a certain kind of authority. And I carry that authority and I carry that sound. When you hear me sing, I'm singing my great grandmother, my grandfather, my grandmother, Minnie, and my mother. My mother had a beautiful alto voice. She was shy, here we go again. So she had this very outgoing, nosy boy uh, who always was asking, what is this? What is that? Why is this? Where is that song? I was always into something and my mother, I drove her crazy. I can say, I know I did because she used to say, get out of here, boy. Don't even come in here. I don't want to know questions. And she had other things on her mind. My mother being an introvert was very much abused by my real father and later on by my stepfather. And these also caused me pain when I think of, the, of the, uh, the, the nightmare that I woke up hearing sometimes when they were fighting and they were calling each other names. And uh, I don't wanna quite go into all the details, but it was not pleasant to, to be with them, to be around them. I wanted to get away. And that is actually part of what saved me in this terrible, terrible uh, catastrophe that was going on, that when I turned out, people welcomed me. They warn warned me up. They said there was a kindness that they gave to me. Whether they were black, white, Asian, Japanese, whatever, I never had str the stranger be rude and nasty, get away from here, that kind of, in that way. Um, 
there was something else that happened uh, years later. But generally speaking, they were always embracing me and helped me to understand the power of the stranger. It helps me a lot, frankly, now when I'm traveling and when I, uh, my, my dear, dear singer, Janet Jordan, she has a gorgeous soprano voice, said to me, Maestro, we've been watching you. You have never met a stranger. Those words are seared in my heart. I love everybody. And everywhere I go, I sing the same way. I don't give you one dose and give them another dose. And hit I try to be as deeply honest and loving, unconditionally loving as I possibly can. I, um, I don't see how I could live my life any differently. Now, I'm very much involved with the racial situation in America because there are many people who won't hear and understand this message if we don't continue to articulate it. We have a lot of people who are entitled. I'm just being frank. I try to say it as gently, but as honestly. And they don't, they feel the fight and battle is over there. Not that it's in here. And when I travel and I sing and I say to them, you are the problem. What? Not me. I'm not doing this. I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, that's it. You're not doing anything in a situation that requires something. So we need to talk about what you can do. <laughs> Maybe you could cook a dinner for somebody. Maybe you could do the lawn, rake the leaf, say hello. You know, there are people who walk around. I say they walk around mad, but I don't. And if someone says hi, I said, hi, how are you? It's that simple. We have got to do what we can to make this world a better place. Well, then let's tack sideways in our spider web here tonight and talk about then what you were, what you did and what you were thinking and feeling when it comes to racial justice and racial awakening on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. You talked about the, the foot washing, which is a famous scene. We saw it in the video earlier this evening uh, that has become so famous, this moment where a white man and a black man were washing their feet together in a pool. So much symbolism, and as you pointed out, so much religious symbolism as well. Mm -hmm. But you were also a police officer, a black police officer. <laughs> and you know, as we think about race and policing in this country today, you say even then it was something that you were not totally comfortable with, but must now feel even more challenging to sort through. I do, Jane, you are very, very perceptive and you nailed it right on. I had a very, very difficult time being Officer Clemens. And Fred and I had some sessions together where we talked about what the police officer could do and could be. One of them, of course, was help a helper. And that stands out a lot to me when I think about this or when I read something in the paper, someone getting shot in the back or hurt with a foot on their knee on your neck. I think those are not helpers. That is not what we were talking about or what Fred was striving to communicate. It was helping with people who are lonely. And I tell you this other thing, he never articulated it as much, but I know he knows that it meant it. People need unconditional love. Everybody needs it. You will not be healthy if you do not have unconditional love. Now it can come from your mom and dad. Of course, that's the best place in the first place. Grandparents, uncles and aunts. But in our world, in our society, how do you develop community if you don't give people unconditional, non-judgmental love? That is the challenge with the entitled people. Those who are well off, who pull in a paycheck and who go home and don't do certain things. They don't understand that they have to give unconditional love and that they have it. And I tell them, open up. If you are, if I'm for in front of a Christian audience or an atheist or whoever, I say to them, if a holy man walked in here today, you wouldn't recognize him because of what you're looking for. Love knows no color. It knows no sex. It knows no age. Grandma's love is just as, as wonderful as my little, little brother or sister or the grandchildren. You must open your heart, America. My dear, 
we have people on the border who are coming here with their hands out begging. Now you just think about it. Would you take a trip for a thousand miles just to give somebody else a hard time, all the nights nice sleeping on the side of the street without your clothes are dirty and uh, the animals that, that are festered there and dragging a child along with you? Those are desperate people. And forgive me, I, I'm not yelling at you, and I'm not, but I, I feel it very deeply. We have to do what we can, which is more than we think we can, because these people are depending on you. Oh, my good. It breaks my heart. Just hear about children who are separated from the mom and dad for five and six and seven years. Even this boy, young man was just united with his mother. And he talked about he all he could do when he got her in, in his arms was cry. He was such joy. We have to do more and we have to do better. Those who are given more, more is expected. That hasn't changed. That has not changed. We have a plenty. And so I open my heart so that people can see it. If you're with me for any period of time, you cannot say you don't understand unconditional love. I have my cosmic children, which you probably want to talk about <laughs> at some point. They are as much a part of my life as singing and writing and spending time in, in the community that's the Unitarian Society. I tell my children, they say, Officer Clemens or Mr. Clemens or Diva Man, I'm called Diva Man. Diva Man, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Two o'clock in the morning, two of my kids called me and told me they were stranded somewhere. And I got in my car and I went and picked them up. They said, why did you pick us up? And I said, that's what daddies do. You know, it's it, interesting to hear you say daddy because you talk very poignantly in the book about your very strong drive to be a mother and specifically a mother, that that's what it feels like to you. That's what it's always felt like, a mothering instinct and that you wanted to be a mother. Do you think of yourself as a, a daddy or a mother to these, these cosmic children who are the children, the young people in your life who you parent and mentor but are not biologically your children? You know, there are times when it's convenient to be the mother and there are times when it's convenient to be the daddy. I, I switch roles because when I'm a little strict, I'm daddy in a certain way. And when I'm loving and caring and nurturing, I consider myself feminine and that's the mother. But I, I, I remember several times when I said to, uh, <clears throat> to some of my students that were having some difficulty there in the college, this is not Professor Clemens and this is not your friend. This is daddy. You get your so-and-so, so-and-so and you do this and that and this, what you must do. And I don't, I don't want to hear an excuse. That's final. The, on the other side, said, come baby. Yeah. What's the matter? You're not alone. Come on. We're, we're going to take care of this together. I, I find that both are very, very important. And I'm uh, a little bit of both. Mm. Mm. I want to remind our audience tonight that you're welcome to share your questions for Francois Clemens as well. You can add them in the chat box. And Steve from Essex has a question for you, Francois. Steve writes, as you wrote your memoir and re-explored your life, is there a part of your story that you view differently today upon reflection? Well, uh, let's say this. I, I experienced a lot of pain when I was young, growing up, the separation from my parents and the anger, the, I feel that I've grown as I've been able to allow myself to look back on that pain. And instead of running away from it, I have pulled it to miss myself. I feel the pain of my mother being beaten up by my father. This is not something I want to talk about. I don't want to brag about. I don't want to have, I thought when I wrote the book, I'd be through with it. But people continually ask me, what was that like? It was very, very painful. But the only way that I overcame it or learned to live with was to pull it to me, pull that to myself. There are lessons I consider them now in life. One of them is, is being alone by myself. Uh, I was searching and, you know, reaching out into the universe. Where is my partner, where's my lover? And I can say that person never appeared. 
that's a lesson for me also. I've had to pull that loneliness very close and hold on to it and say, this is, the, this is the real you. And there is a lesson that we have in our society, in the world. We need to learn to be alone. Because when you are alone, you have time to think. It's an emotional thinking. It's not just intellectual thinking. It's deep soul thinking. You go in there and you listen to what your body is telling you. And you, it's, it's not just one, one way or the other. It's the totality of who you are. And as you continue to get settled and get quiet, and as we get older, I think we are more settled and we are more able to do serious thinking because that is the only thing that's gonna get us through this next episode. As you well know, we've had the pandemic. It ain't over. Everybody out there with a brain knows that. So in order to get to that next point in the road, because we're having fewer deaths, we're having more shots, but we, the world, look at India, the world is having problems. Therefore, we are having problems. And we must figure out how not only to aid our immigrants who are on the borders, whether it's Canadian or Mexico, but also we have to look out what's happening to the girls in as Afghanistan. We have to look at uh, Myanmar. Not that we're going to go and change and run, you know, and bomb and carry on, but there are subtle ways that we can reach out and embrace the world. We must do it. We must, because otherwise we're going to destroy this world. I, I really feel we have this power to be very destructive. I, I remember when I realized that we were killing lions and tigers and elephants and hippopotami. I love animals. I think there should be lots of reservations where there's no, mankind don't go in there because the animals are in there. We have to learn to live with these creatures on this earth. It's the only one we have. I mean, they're going up to Mars and other places and looking around, but there's no place up there we can live. It seems so obvious, so plain. So we need to learn how to get along here on earth. And an awful lot of it is greed, entitlement and greed. We feel we have to have more and not less. I look around my, <laughs> my house and I see all this stuff. Most of it has been given to me. And I'm constantly giving something away to this one, giving something away to that one. My cosmic children, almost every single one of them has a necklace. And these are, these are not cheap, dude. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. But if I see one, put it on. Or if I put one on them, I say, okay, that's yours. What? You're going to give? Yes, that's yours. It's like keeping it in the family. Now, what was your question you asked me? <laughs> they asked me uh, what, if I feel differently now. What was it? Um, do you remember? Well, I'm going to ask you a different question because you've, you've oh. taken us in a different direction now again, Francois. So <laughs> you mentioned, I was saying, uh, well, we were talking about being an introvert or an extrovert and, uh, and various things. And you said at one point in the book that you realize you do not do well by yourself alone for long periods of time. And you're just talking now about the importance of being alone, but you also know yourself well enough to know that you can't always be alone. And those thoughts are not gonna be helpful to you if you're swirling in them constantly through the pandemic. So perhaps I should for full disclosure reveal that you and my father is among the people who has spent a lot of time with you over the pandemic, but you, you have found ways to stay connected to people face-to-face -face who, who are important to you because that's the only way you thrive, it sounds like. Well, I, I, I thought of why you were saying that, soup for the soul, because your father is so special to me. He doesn't talk too much. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that is that. a first. My father does talk too much, but maybe he can get a word in edgewise with you. No, and we joke about that all the time, but uh, I have developed what I call Two, two groups of friends. One is my kitchen cabinet, which is my goes back 50 years to Oberlin. And then I have a diva pod here in the community, which actually started with the Unitarian, the Champlain Valley Universalist Society. There were friends there who, who saw that I was having a certain kind of stress. 
And I remember Katie Gridley, my pianist, was one of the ones who said, well, what's the matter with you? I said, I need someone to come and sit and talk to me. And she is uh, very much of a, of a person who knows how to get stuff done. So I know who to talk to. And she helped to arrange for soup to be brought in. And when people brought in soup, they would sit and we would chat. And uh, Steve Meyer is another one of my buddies who uh, is a part of this diva pod. And almost every single day, somebody comes by my house. I can't tell you how grateful I am to the universe that heard me crying out that I need somebody. And I don't have a single lover, but I have many. I feel like I married the church. <laughs> I married the Unitarian church because, uh, and there are others of course, who are not a part of the Unitarian church. They're part of either Middlebury College or their townspeople who also have been drawn into my circle. And the only thing it was, we had to be careful for the time earlier time we wore our masks. All of us were in, in the process of getting our shots. Um, I think it's important that we say this. And then we found time to sit down and talk about what's going on in the world because we are a part of it and we are responsible. Our attitudes also create some of the negativity, some of the things we don't want. And I said in one of my most re recent uh, interviews, that the most difficult thing I've been doing in the last couple of years is sending unconditional love to Donald Trump. He, he needs it. He needs to know that he's loved for himself, not for those, those mar -a Laga, whatever, and the, the, his name upon the gambling casino or his name on that. No, put all that aside, the, the gold, the, the BS, and let's, let's deal with Donald. Let's accept him for who he is. Now, that means he has to learn to give and take in the world. He feels he has to dominate. I'm, I'm not gonna go off on, on, on this forever, but each one of us has something like that in our lives that we have to reach out and embrace. I've always tried, I wasn't, haven't always been successful, but I tried to make so-called rivals or enemies into friends. And I, I tell you, there are many doors that they opened for me because they saw us as friends rather than rivals. Now that particular subject had to do with the opera, trying to be an opera singer in the time when they weren't hiring black men to sing leading, I'm a romantic tenor, that's my voice. And they weren't necessarily hiring us. So I, I had to do an awful lot of embracing my peers and colleagues who were working and not resent them because they were white and entitled. They never experienced that kind of discrimination. And at the same time, uh, several of my buddies uh, in, in New York City got together and uh, they signed me up to do uh, La Traviata, one of the Verdi operas, but another tenor was supposed to do it. And they came to me and said, you weren't at that audition and they didn't call you. This is perfect for your voice. We're gonna come by your house. We're gonna teach you the parts, have you sung? I said, no, we're gonna teach you then the part uh, of the tenor and we're, we're going to call the lady or the gentleman in charge and tell them I'm sick, I can't do the job. And we're gonna say, but we know somebody who can do the job and will do a, a wonderful job. And the point I just wanna make was I, I became a student to my friends. They were wonderful teachers, they really were. So I learned and when the day, I said, I'm Francois Clemens. I'm supposed to sing the tenor role. And they said, you can't be Francois Clemens. We just spoke to him on the telephone. <laughs> that was the dumbest. That was the dumbest remark I ever heard in my whole life because I, I, I guess I didn't sound black on the telephone. And therefore she had some image or some idea who I was. Now, anyway, I did a fantastic job and I got hired three, four, five times by that same company and they never hired another black person. I kept looking, hoping that when I would go in there to do the next opera, there would be another uh, minority member of the cast, never was, never was. But that to me shows you something that is for some people is a little thing to do was a huge, huge thing for a guy like me trying to make a living as an opera singer. I had several instances like that. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna dwell uh, forever on, you know, because there were some wonderful things that happened to me when people 
uh, came to my aid, uh, Maestro Strasbourg was a story I love to tell. The Metropolitan Opera was rigged. Everybody knew it was rigged. Uh, the soprano in Cleveland chose one part and the soprano in, in uh, Chicago, she chose the n number two. And he looked at me and said, the only part I get to choose is number three. And I gave it to you because I think you are a wonderful singer. You deserve it. And he said to me, if you will work with me, there's more than one way to win this competition. Now, I had no idea what he was talking about. But that gentleman wrote a letter to the Metropolitan Opera people and told them who I was, what I had done, and that I was coming to New York with his recommendation. So sure enough, as life would have it, I call on the telephone. I say, well, Maestro Strasbola said this and that and blah, blah. They said, we don't know anything about that. What are you talking about? You're just trying to get a free ride. No, forget it. So they hung up the phone. Fred Rogers, I told him the story. He said, we will get you a ticket to New York, Francois, and we'll get you a reservation at Blah Blah Hotel. Sure enough, we flew up to New York, stayed the hotel. When I walked into the Metropolitan Opera for the, where the audition was being held, the gentleman said, oh, Mr. Clemens, I understand we owe you a check. None of the people that worked with him said, they said, 20 something years, Maestro Strasvogel had been here and he had never recommended another person. You are the first one and we just didn't believe you because he doesn't do that. So, and not only did they pay me a check for the, my trip in the hotel, they gave me a couple of extra days. And then after I sang for him, they gave me a job and I went home with about $10,000. Uh, scholarship money and stuff. And when I had a chance to, to make that full circle when Maestro Strasvogel said, are you happy now? <laughs> Heck yeah, I was happy. You better believe I was. There were things like that that happened to allow me to continue with my singing career. But it was hard trying to get a job, trying to get not just a singing job, a teaching job at some of the colleges and universities because they wanted stars from the Metropolitan Opera, people who had long histories of doing excellent Verdi, excellent Puccini, excellent Verismo, whatever. And they were, some of them were international. That's who they were looking for to be on their staff. They weren't looking for the guy who didn't get the job and who needed the job to eat. Yeah. But uh, as I say, there were many things that turned uh, my way and in my direction over the period of times. Uh, one thing I just uh, would like to add, Jane, you didn't particularly ask, but something that's very, very important to me, and that is cast your bread on the water. Give. Be kind to other people because it, it comes back in the most surprising ways imaginable. I have a, had a career. I'm still having a career because I mentor some of everybody. If they when the kids came there, if they needed a place to stay, if they needed to borrow the car, if we needed to go, I needed to take them somewhere. If they needed to, uh, over the holiday time, sometimes they, back there in, in 1997, 98, 99, they were not doing such a good job with some of those kids who were stuck up there in the dorm. And I said, come to my house. We cook Thanksgiving dinners. We, we send people home with uh, uh, plastic or whatever containers. There's always something you can do to, to, and the universe smiles. And I have, I've had so many, so many wonderful things happen. Well, and you write eloquently in the book about some of the people who helped you over the years, some people who took you in, you lived with them. For yes, time. I did. I you, did. I did. And you, and you also write about challenges that you faced, racism that you faced. And, you know, what people said was your sort of constant naivete that you never lost this sense of innocence. And so you were always surprised and always wounded when you faced it. Well, but I give you write about both of those in the book. I give them the benefit of the doubt. I think when you meet a person the first time, it's, it's so much easier to just think positive. You don't have to concoct some story uh, about how they behave or what they've done or what their past is like. As a matter of fact, a lot of times what helps them <laughs> to be the best that they can be is they know that that's what you're thinking. I'm only thinking what's best. I'm only thinking what's good. I don't harbor, I don't live with that other junk because that's what it is, junk. 
And I find that there are people who have had a certain kind of history and they say, well, Francois thinks I can do this. Maestro thinks I should. I, I've had some kids who went into theater who found that they had a voice. Other teachers will have some of the same experiences, but I wasn't searching for young singers or searching for that young bass or baritone or that young writer. I have several of my boys who send beautiful poetry and I can't wait until they decide they're ready to publish. Um, I've had a couple of girls in particular uh, and, and one fellow who is a Russian bass baritone, but there are a couple of others who are wonderful singers you know, uh, this atmosphere is one where you have to encourage the ones who say, I want to sing. So I've never charged for a voice lesson. And I've given a few in my time <laughs> because I think it's important to give. And I do have something to give, but I require that the person be serious. That's all I, uh, I require. If you're serious, then that means you'll be here. It's important to you, then it's important to me. If it's not important to you, it's not important to me. I'm not going to force you to want to be a, you know, a basketball player or a singer or a mathematician or something like that. I let them lead the way. And then I, I encourage and I can nurture. And uh, sometimes I can give them advice. I uh, took a couple of Middlebury uh, students down to Pittsburgh when Fred Rogers was still alive and was still filming. And I can't, I don't think it's appropriate to call names, but several of them are still in, uh, uh, television reporting, they're reporters. And when I see them on television, I say, that, mm -hmm. he got his start with me. Mm -hmm. I remember when I took her down to Pittsburgh so she could meet the gang and, and, you know, be in a real studio and have people coming and going and showing her the script and various things that were going on. They were very, very liberal with the, st the students that I brought down to Pittsburgh. I also took my students to New York every single year during J term in January at the end of J term. I got the most pleasure out of it. They said they did, but I, uh, because I lived there for uh, 35 years. So I had an apartment and boy, I remember once uh, everybody crowding into that New York apartment. It was, we had so much silly fun because there wasn't enough room. <laughs> and I took them to Sylvia's restaurant. I take them to Broadway shows. Uh, I, I, we did things that I like doing, you know, museums, some of the wonderful, wonderful museums. I even took a, a couple of my uh, guys, that, as I recall, to the Metropolitan Opera, and they had never been in a place like that before. And I thought, well, you know, stick with me. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Wow. I, yes. Oh, we, we have only a couple more minutes left. So and I know this is going to be selfish here for me, but I know I will never be asked to interview you again. And everybody who's watching tonight will send me letters if I don't get you to sing. And luckily, Pam and Shelburne wrote in asking if you have a favorite spiritual and maybe oh. we can combine Pam's question with my uh, need, my the reason I've been hired to get you to <laughs> sing as well as talk. Oh, Lord have mercy. All right, my favorite spiritual. This little light of mine, oh, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, oh, This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, oh Lord. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, Lord, let it shine. Oh, everywhere I go, y'all, I'm 
gonna let it shine. Well, 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 everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, everywhere I go, Lord, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. How's that? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, I have to confess, I have one other thing here for you, Jane. Oh, yeah? There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say I love you. There's the singing way to say, I love you. There's the singing something someone really likes to hear. The singing way, the singing way, the singing way to say, I love you. Cleaning up your room can say, I love you. Hanging up your coat before your ass too. Drawing special pictures for the holidays and making plays. You'll find many ways to say, I love you. You'll find many ways to understand what love is. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say I It's always such a treat to hear you sing, whether you're in your living room or on a giant stage or <laughs> at the Flynn Theater or on television. You know, I think what we've been talking about this evening, Francois, with your ability to feel present and to feel emotions and to feel the people you're singing to is wonderful and special. And I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. You know, I think maybe we should leave it there and, and let that singing take us into the evening and take us back into our lives. But I will say for folks who are watching, don't forget you can see the link to buy the book in the chat. And the book is wonderful. It's wonderful to read. <laughs> I keep saying. <laughs> well, and unlike the spider web of an interview we have, which I love because we go in so many different tangents, it was so neat to be able to trace your story from your childhood into Youngstown, Ohio, into Oberlin. I mean, we could spend another hour talking about your love life, which you detail yes. pretty impressively in this book and, and some of the romantic partners you've had who have been so important to you in your life. And we could talk about your time more in Pittsburgh and more with Fred Rogers. We could talk more about your time at well, Middlebury. And the book. That's I right. will say this, Jane, I am writing a second book. Mm. That it, it will have a, a connection, definitely a relationship and a connection to the first book. Because number one, there were some things that were cut out that I would like to include. And secondly, so many wonderful things have happened to me since this book was published. My goodness, what a wonderful thing to, to be alive now. Really, really, mm -hmm. that's how I feel. Well, I can't wait, wait to read volume two. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to chat with all of us tonight and, and to answer my questions. Thank you, Francois. My pleasure, Jane, always.
ladies and gentlemen, the great Francois Clemens. The book is called Officer Clemens, a memoir. And on behalf of the staff at Vermont PBS, again, thank you so much to Francois. And thank you viewers to all of you for joining us this evening, for the questions that you sent us, for your wonderful presence that I, I swear we can feel through the screens, mm -hmm. even though we can't see you. Again, to purchase an autographed copy of the paperback version of Officer Clemens, click on the link in the chat to order one from Phoenix Books. And this recording will be up on the Vermont PBS YouTube channel, so you can find it again and share it with your friends. To all of you watching this evening, on behalf of Vermont PBS, thank you and good night. Thank you.